I heard you. I passed it on. It's Chris. I passed it on. They're all chatting. Chatty caddies. <laughs> no problem. Jesse says make sure Connor does his usual routine of counting down. I just pass it along. All right, I'm going off mic. One minute. Yes, sir. All right, you can hear me? If you're talking to me, I can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yummy. Yummy! Yeah, they're really good. <laughs> it's always tough to do, uh, to do radio or television when you have the food in front of you, but you can't eat it. Why can't you? We gotta talk. <laughs> no rules, brother. <laughs> there are no rules. Come on. <sighs> Three, two, one. All right. Welcome to a new edition of Hockey Prime Time. Uh, we are live in South Philadelphia. Just a hop, skip, and a jump from Wells Fargo Center. This is a new edition of Hockey Prime Time. I'm Connor McKenna. We're live at Chickies and Pete's in South Philadelphia, and it is a yeah. pleasure to welcome in our first guest of the day. Uh, joining us here on site, it's Bill Clement, two-time mm -hmm. Stanley Cup champ. Loves thank you, thank you. CSN Philadelphia. Just and it's and when I'm at Chickies. I can't say when I'm with you, I feel like I'm at home because this is brand new to me. I feel like I'm a guest, but I do feel like I'm at home because it's chickies. And I, I noticed that this isn't your first time experiencing no, a crab I, fries. I know either. how to know how to handle them. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, they uh, they they yep. look they taste uh, better than they look, and uh, they sounded pretty good there too. That was a convincing bite. You chose a crunchy one there. Uh, they've Thank made you. us a crab fry poutine. It's a concoction that they've put together here. I believe there's fried cheese in there there's a, a, a meat that i'm not sure exactly what it is it oh, looks no, no, wait good a minute. there's no mystery you're not allowed to put mystery meat in, I in think pretend it's that probably you beef. can't do that and uh, i like the way you pronounce that bill i was not aware of this uh, doing a little homework before the show you and i are are, are both quebecers you mm -hmm. are a native uh, quebecer right yeah. so you've you've had a poutine or two in your time yes i have and uh, how does the uh, crab fry poutine measure up a um, little different recipe still very good don't expect to have it taste like this when you go up to Quebec, right? But you're going to love it one way or the other. It is. It is very good. Big thank you to the guys at Chickies and Pete's for uh, putting it together for us. It is April Fool's Day. This will be an April Fool's joke-free show. I'm not going to uh, tell you anything crazy or, or make up any crazy stories. Uh, you can do that if you want, Bill. But I'm. 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 That's my promise to you that we will not okay. do that. Uh, but you've got some experience, uh, and I see you've changed your name to Major Clement on uh, on Twitter. What's What's the meaning? Well, I was in the Army, the, uh, the U.S. Army, for a while, for three days. Three days. Actually, during a training uh, film that we did. And it was to teach um, U.S. Army personnel how to fight against Russian helicopters. And it was shot in about 1985. I auditioned for it in Atlanta, and I was cast. And I got blown away at the end of the video, <laughs> at, the, at, the end of the, at the end of the training thing. With, uh, I had... Uh, you know, blood packs under my shirt and 
I hit the plunger when, when I got hit with the machine gun and did a okay. stun fall and everything. And um, it, it seems kind of funny, you know, w watching it now, and especially because it almost makes light of this of this the seriousness and the the dedication and the the vulnerability of people who really are in the military that go out and risk their lives, you know, to to protect people and to protect countries and stuff like that. For me, it was a job back then, and it was a lot of fun, and it was make believe, um, and. Uh, I'm changing the name of my radio show to Major Clements Hockey World. I have a show on WBCB. We are at Chickies and Pete's every Wednesday. That's why all of the Chickies are kind of home to me. And um, the name of the show moving forward will be Major, because I was Major Clement in the uh, in the industrial video. Okay. It's it's going to be Major Clements Hockey World moving forward. Name change. Okay. Giant announcement. Well, this is Close huge. the schools. We're probably going to have a parade and a holiday within a couple of days to celebrate it, but for now it's just a name change to the show, Major Clements Hockey World. And that's a, uh, that's a hockey primetime exclusive. Wow, uh, that's, uh, this is great. And uh, so going forward, and, and uh, is it, it's, you said Wednesdays it's at uh, Chickies. Uh, yep. Is it on every day? or uh, The shows are Wednesdays from 6 to 7 p.m. Oh, at Chickies and Peas. And we move around, yeah. Okay. We're at Parks Casino. Come on in. Park anywhere. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, with uh, Bill Clement. And uh, I know you do some motivational speaking as well, uh, which uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, I actually do quite a bit of it yeah. um, around the, the country, around the world, the continent, Canada, and the U.S. And I started about 30 years ago. The genesis of it was me, after my, my 11 years in the NHL, diving headlong into a restaurant franchising business and losing everything from my home to my marriage to my money I filed corporate and personal bankruptcy and I had no job no training no college degree I was scared I was broke I was depressed and I started learning about life very quickly and uh, was able to, to, to generate a number of, of successes in various careers and at some point I was said I was asked to to come and speak to a group and, and to tell them the steps that I took you know to make it back and I thought I haven't spent any time self-examining and, and, and asking myself how I did that but as I went through you know, the processes that I, I actually followed to become successful again, I realized that there were things of value to other people. So ended up writing a book. It's called Everyday Leadership. Wayne Gretzky wrote the foreword for me. Uh, Crossing Gorges on Tight Ropes to Success is the uh, subtitle. And uh, there actually is a shot of me crossing a tightrope over Grand Canyon on the cover. And it's, it's an autobiography, but it deals, it's, it's full of life lessons as well. It's done really well, sold really well, and I'm still pretty active doing um, I, I hesitate to call them motivational presentations because I don't want to be perceived as a guy that goes into an audience, makes everybody feel good, and two days later they can't remember one thing that I said. So I, I, I try to, there's a value proposition uh, and value takeaways that I try to create, and it's gone, done exceptionally well. Cool. Did one last week, have one next week. All right. Yeah. And uh, it, there's a website, uh, correct? Yep, yep, BillClement.com. BillClement.com. Uh, all right, uh, so uh, we're talking... With Bill Clement, we got to talk about the Flyers, of course, who are in action against their nemesis, yeah. the New Jersey Devils. Man. And, you know, I, I think about the Flyers' season, and, and there's that amazing 10-game run of really sort of improbable wins, too, along the way, right? It wasn't as if they were mopping the floor with the opponents, but they'd pull off these great comebacks, dramatic wins, and then it all comes to a crashing halt against the Devils. Yeah. And now here we are again. There's a chance that the Devils could be the ones who end their uh, their playoff aspirations. Sure. I'm, I'm, you know, the way you describe that 10-game winning streak, I think, is accurate. It was improbable because some of the ways the Flyers won. It wasn't as if they were dominant. They just strung 10 wins together through various means, and I'm not sure that was an indication that the team might not have been as, as, as strong as the 10 consecutive wins would have indicated. Yeah, the Devils, for some reason, over the last three weeks, there have been two games that have really put the Flyers behind the eight ball and made them astronomical long shots to make the playoffs unless two or three teams in front of them crash and burn. And the two games were the 6-2 to two loss in New Jersey and then the 4-1 to one loss in Winnipeg, two teams that aren't going to make the playoffs that you have to beat that didn't happen. And the Devils play their rear ends off against the Flyers. And I, I, I'm i going to be shocked if the Flyers don't bring their their triple-A game to this, you know, to the Wells Fargo Center tonight. If they don't, then this problem against the Devils is far deeper than any of us wants to admit. And part of it is Steve Mason struggles against the Devils. And yeah. the, the numbers are... 0 and 9 with an 8.52 career save percentage. I'm not sure we're going to get. I'm not sure he's going to get a chance to expand on those numbers tonight. Uh, and he won't. And right. with, with good reason, right? I mean, if you sure. want to give yourself a chance, I, 
it's strange how these things happen. You know, Steve Mason's been a good NHL goaltender, a, a get goaltender. At times, he's been a great NHL goaltender. Sure. But more good than great. But still, 0-9 oh, with an 852 save percentage. It's hard. It's a big enough sample size. It's hard to explain something like that, isn't it? It, it is. I, th I think, though, in the early going, it's coincidence, right? You lose two or three. But the Devils, as a team, have the Flyers' numbers. Not as if the Devils have Steve Mason's number. So Ma Mason is is thrown into that mix of, of a team that can't do well, therefore he can't do well. And at some point, it's kind of in your head, I guess, if you're a goaltender. I don't know many goaltenders if you say to them, you know what, you play 10 games against these guys and you haven't beat them. What's the problem? I can't imagine a goalie saying, I got no problem. I imagine a goalie would say, I'm trying to figure that out myself, but that means that there is something going on. So that's why you have two goalies, though, Connor. Right? Right. And at the same or time... Three. Call one up. But if you, you know, and there's another saying, though, if you have two goalies, and I know everyone has two, but if you've, if you've got two guys that you're leaning on, then you don't have a goalie. I mean, the, the Flyers' goaltending woes are so well documented and go back for so long, and now here we are. It seems like we're at a crossroads again. I mean, is this, do you get the sense that this might be the end of the Steve Mason era in goal winding down here this year? It very well could be, and then again, it might not be. Michael Neuverd has signed Right, the Flyers have to expose a signed goalie in the expansion draft for, La for Las Vegas. So they will undoubtedly, I believe, expose Michael Neuver. If by chance he is chosen in the expansion draft, I really believe the Flyers would make a run as Steve Mason. Ron Hextall knows they're both capable of winning games. It will depend on who else is available out there and how much it would cost them. But st they've given Steve Mason a chance to either sink or swim here recently, right? In the last 15 games, yeah. he's played remarkably well without a contract, so there's that emotional stress, too, that he's going through, having to play for his future. I think he's done really well, so I think there's a chance that he will end up back here. If he does, the Flyers will have, I think, a young goalie with him in the mix. The Flyers now are lo loaded with almost too many goaltenders. You can, only, you can only develop five, two in the NHL, two in the AHL, and one in the ECHL, right. really, right? But I think there will be, I think there will, will be one of Michael Neuvert or Steve Mason and a younger player. Either Alex Lyon or, or Anthony Stolarz would be my guess. And you know what? The, uh, the Neuwirth in Vegas scenario that you outline is very plausible, right? George, it, yeah. The, the kind of guy that they'd be looking for to maybe mentor, mm. maybe uh, Philip Grubauer or somebody yeah. like that, somebody to work with. Except he's been dinged up a lot. Yeah. You know, you want a player that is not going to be on the IR often, and Michael Neuwirth's had trouble staying healthy, even though there's a great familiarity there because George McPhee, the GM in Vegas, brought him into the league. Yeah. But... Uh, Grubauer, unless he's traded, is uh, Washington's going to have to leave him unprotected. Yeah. So yeah. He's maybe the relationship goes way back. But look, I, I, I talked to George McPhee the other day, and he said, this is crazy. He said, the trade deadline, you'd be dealing with five teams going down to the wire. He said, I got a three-day span. I'm talking to 30 teams about all kinds of you know, trades and signing free agents and who's unprotected, who's protected, what are we going to do? He said, it's going to be absolutely crazy and it will be it will be like uh, like um, trade deadline day times 20 oh, well especially if given this year's trade deadline day maybe times 50 yeah right right as anticlimactic as sure. it was I'm glad also that they're they're releasing the lists of the players ahead of yeah. time uh, this was it really it was so frustrating from a fan what standpoint. kind of fun would that have been for us right exactly you know, and, you know, I was talking. We want to. We want to be able to tell everybody all of the mistakes that they made. Right. You know, all the bad, bad, bad picks that they made. That's it. And I was. You know, it's funny. I was talking to Darren Dreger about this the other day, and I'm like, oh, you know, Dregs, this is great, uh, great news for you uh, too, isn't it? He's like, you know what? I'm very relieved. He's like, I was going to have to spend 24 hours sending email after email right. and text after text trying to get this information out. Now the information is going to be made public. He can worry about uh, bigger and, and better. Things. And if not getting the information, then all everybody gets to do is to speculate. Everybody specs. And, uh, how interesting is that? You're just throwing out theory, possible theory, possible theory, possible theory. Now it's going to be tangible. I can't wait. It's fun. I mean, expansion drafts are fun. Unless you're one of the guys that might be picked and left unprotected, as was the case when, when I was playing uh, and the league was expanding. And I thought, are the Flyers going to protect me here? And it turned out they did at the last moment. I think it was a coin toss. Well, there are worse fates than it, and it depends if it's your kind of town, but there could be worse fates than ending up in a, a great climate like that, and uh, oh. a world-class city, very good restaurants, a uh, few things to do, I guess, in Vegas, right? Well, it's it's a roll of the dice, one well, way or the other. What do you think, I mean, if... From I, love, I love it. And, and I know, but imagine, having played in the league, 
what might it have been like you and the Broad Street Bullies going through Vegas in the 70s? Would that be something that you would have liked to have done? Was that something that you guys would have been able to survive doing back then? We would have had to have our bank robber masks pulled <laughs> way up over our noses yeah. back then because we kind of rode in and ran roughshod over, <laughs> over the hockey right, team. exactly. And sort of pillaged and plundered and then left the town again. So uh, the, the, the problem, for, uh, I, it's going to be really interesting to see what teams do to try to make sure that they can keep track of their players. Some teams don't have any problems with that. Other teams have players that like to... They like to cruise a little bit. They like to get out and about and get around, sure. right? Get around town. Well, guess what? You can get lost in Las Vegas. No kidding. So. Well, they wouldn't be the first, right? And, uh, yeah, I mean, as long as you don't end up, uh, you know, uh, buried in the desert, then you're fine, basically, right? right? right. Hey, right. Uh, Bill, thanks for your time. Hey, before I let you go, uh, i got to ask you about Patrick Eliash, uh, the uh, great devil who called it quits officially yesterday. Uh, what do you think? A next stop Hall of Fame? Is, is he at that, uh, at that level in your eyes? Yes. Yeah? I believe he is. He was an all-situation player, like 409 goals. He's what, to over 1,200 games. The, the thing that puts him over the top, and for years I would look down and I'd say, there's Patrick Eliash. He's one of the, right now, one of the five to six or seven best wingers in the game. And then year after year, he would be in that category, two-way winger. You're up by a goal, down by a goal. He'd be the, last, he'd be the guy that you want out there. But the two Stanley Cups and, and, and the numbers that he put up in the playoffs, had he not won two Stanley Cups, I would say... Mm, you know, we got to look at this a little closer. Right. But when you're, and he was an integral part of two cups. He played on great teams, but he, he grabbed onto the rope and pulled as hard as he could and did his share of contributing to the Stanley Cup. So I'd be shocked if Patrick Elias, and I look at the other guys comparable in numbers to him. There were 10 that I was looking at. They're all in. They're all, I mean, everybody from Adam Oates to, you know, to Scott Stevens to, they're, they're all in. All right. So. There you go. And uh, coming from a uh, two-time Stanley Cup champ with the Philadelphia Flyers, respect for a New Jersey Devil lifer. So uh, that's, that's <laughs> got to count for something. Hey, Bill, thanks for your time, man. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, okay, brother. We'll see you soon, I hope. Come on back and visit when you can. That's Bill Clement of CSN Philly, two-time Stanley Cup champ. I'm Connor McKenna. No Stanley Cup rings on my resume, yeah. but uh, I have hosted a few radio shows. Uh, coming up next, we're going to chat with Kerry Frazier. Uh, let's find out if this hacking guys on the hands thing is something the league needs to crack down on before someone else loses a finger. This is Hockey Primetime on Sirius XM NHL Network Radio, live from Chickies and Pete's in South Philly. Okay, thank you. Gary, we got you in here. There we go. We're going this way. 
Uh, so this Westhead thing, is it the thing from earlier this week, or is there something yeah, new? Yeah, no, okay, well, okay. I, think, I don't think there's anything newer, but... I went Whoa. into hiding for a day. All right, three, two, one. Hey, welcome back. This is Hockey Primetime. We're coming to you live from Chickies and Pete's in South Philly. I've got a crab fry poutine in front of me, and I'm not allowed to eat it. i got to host the show here. Uh, my name is Connor McKenna. We're here live on site before the uh, Devils and the Flyers tonight. Uh, the Devils have a chance to knock the Flyers out of postseason contention, and uh, the Flyers have a chance to get a little revenge against the Devils team that's had their way with them all year long. A pleasure to welcome in our next guest. He is uh, one of the most recognizable, I'd say from my perspective as a kid who grew up in the uh, 80s and 90s, the face of refereeing in the NHL, now with TSN, Kerry Frazier. How you doing, man? Good, Connor, or the hair of refereeing maybe absolutely I, yeah still well. going strong too <laughs> yeah it hasn't fallen out yet yeah that's well i mean i think once you've made it to this point i think you're probably you're in business man. highly overrated <laughs> <laughs> that uh, poutine looks good i what are you taking a picture of it or what well i you know i mean it looks this, this is the torture of hosting uh, any kind of a radio or a tv show with food in front of you you just you, you got to be a pro you can't eat the food True. right so well bill clement it. had some so I I, what's that. that what's that mean he is that's not I, well I, I i would never say anything like that of <laughs> Of course not. Uh, so, uh, Kerry, lots of stuff going on around the National Hockey League as mm -hmm. the playoffs approach. And, and let's go back in time, if we can, to last weekend when the outrage was all about Sidney Crosby slashing Mark Mathot, okay. a significant injury, and the Senators have looked significantly weakened since that point. And it started a conversation, right? It, it seems as if guys decided that, okay, if I slash a stick and it breaks, I'm going to get called for a penalty. So I'm going to slash guys on the hands. They do it all the time. Yeah. It's happening everywhere, and it's not getting called. And uh, the Mathot thing uh, doesn't seem to have changed anything. But what do you make of this? Is this a big problem right now in the league? Well, it is when, you know, half a finger is uh, dangling at the end. Uh, Mark Mathot, though, was shooting the puck, and he was in the act of shooting. Uh, his hands were moving through the shot. Sidney Crosby did what every other player does. It's a stick check, an active stick. Uh, and it was intended to be on the shaft, but as a result of, of Mathot's follow-through of his shot, release of the shot, the hand was there. It caught the tip of the finger. Um, it's not something that I think, uh, obviously, bad result, but it, it wasn't an illegal play, and it's not something that uh, I think is, is an ec epidemic. Uh, sticks that break, I think, you know, that smoking gun, there are times, and, and the description in the rule book and, and the standard that the referees are supposed to adhere to is a powerful, forceful. Those are the definition words, uh, the key words that they have to rule on. So if it's a light tap and a stick breaks, just because the stick breaks, that shouldn't be a penalty. And, you know, it's funny, too, that, and I know this is probably not something Flyers fans want to hear necessarily, but Sidney Crosby... It maybe gets more of that than anybody in the National Hockey League. I mean, this is a guy who's constantly getting hacked, slashed, hooked, whatever it is you want to say. And a lot of it does go uncalled. Mm -hmm. well, the way that it is right now, and I think back 10 years ago to coming out of the lockout and, and the obstruction crackdown and everything that went with it, and now where we are right now, why do you think that it is that it's changed so much since that, that time? Why so much more seems to be allowed now than it was back then? Well, you know, there's been slippage, and uh, the officials have to be held accountable. Um, you know, we were when we came back from that first lockout in 05. There was videos that were coming out constantly to keep everybody on standard. Um, I, I think the other element, too, Connor, is that you've got an awful lot of young officials. There's been a changing of the guard. Uh, these gu young guys that are coming up now out of the American Hockey League, some of them have had as few as 20 games in the American League, uh, and all of a sudden they're thrust into the NHL through injury, through attrition, uh, and they're not ready. The other element of that is they've been incubated in a two-referee system. When we came up, it was a one-referee system. We earned our spurs. We were the guy out there that had to make all the decisions. Now you've got two refs, one doing different things uh, at each end, and you've got the, the, uh, the spy in the sky that's looking over their shoulder. 
And uh, you know what? We actually have a spy in the sky looking over uh, our shoulders here uh, right now. Hello there. Hi, guys. And uh, you know what? It's, it's true because I remember hearing, too, about becoming an official, becoming a referee in the National Hockey League, and, and maybe the most important factor being you got to know how to skate. I mean, you got to be able to skate, and you got to be able to skate fast, and you got to be able to go from side to side. Has that changed much with the two referee system? I mean, it, obviously, it's still important, but is it less important? Well, it's a different form of skating. I mean, you skate backwards fast because you lead the play. You skate slower forwards, uh, trailing the play. But really, it's it's important to have the physical attributes. But most importantly, is you have to know how to referee. Uh, you know, you can have great skating skills but you can have very poor judgment. You can have poor uh, interpersonal relationships with players, communicative skills. There's a whole package and a whole host of things that have to be worked on. Uh, young guys coming in, uh, they have to earn their spurs. Uh, they have to develop uh, the rapport uh, with players and earn their respect. It doesn't come instantly. Uh, when some people are insecure, they tend to be more aggressive. They lash out. Uh, that doesn't uh, bode well for the players. Uh, I, I've heard all kinds of complaints that these young guys uh, or the referees today, uh, sometimes you just can't talk to them. Right, and and that's so important too, isn't it? The the communication level. Big time, big time. You know, I, I, talking to Brendan Gallagher, who joins me on uh, TSN 690, every Monday we get a hit with Brendan Gallagher, a guy who's uh, had an interesting relationship with officials and yep. an evolving one throughout the course of his NHL career. But it's something that he recently was telling us was that, you know, he feels like it's taken time, uh, but he's been able to earn a sort of a measure of respect uh, from officials as he's played his career. And guys like that, I mean, you refereed tons of guys like that. Sure. Guys who like to get into goaltenders' grills, uh, guys who like to play on a certain edge. Uh, how does a relationship evolve between officials and a young player, especially like that? I'm, I'm thinking even of Matthew Kachuk, who's a different player, sure. but a young player who looks very comfortable in the National Hockey League already. Well, at Connor, it starts with building mutual respect. And the first thing that I did, and I love the way Brennan Gallagher plays, uh, and I wrote many times in TSN articles where he was going down rather lightly. He wasn't setting himself up with officials in a good light. Uh, those guys talk to each other. They build a book on guys. Uh, so he was really hurting himself early in his career, and he had to c overcome that. But the first thing that I did when a young player came into the league, and I would check the press notes always before a game, I'd see who I had not met before. Young draft pick, I'd go and I'd introduce myself to him right off the bat. How do you do? I'm Kerry Fraser. Uh, just want to wish you a uh, terrific career. Stay safe. And if you ever have a problem out here, know that you can approach me in the appropriate way and I'll give you an answer. So I wanted to set the table with young guys. And these are young guys that probably were watching me work the Stanley Cup Finals when they, you know, like Crosby and et cetera, yeah. uh, when they were young kids. So I wanted to be take that first step. I wanted to be proactive and I wanted to work at developing a relationship in a non-aggressive situation. Uh, speaking of uh, interesting situations, I did. I got to ask you about what's gone on this week. Uh, Rick Westhead with the latest revelations from the National Hockey League, the emails leaked. It's fascinating to me too to hear how so many fans are reacting in a way uh, that it makes it seem like the emails are coming out and they were just written last week. These emails are, in some cases, a decade old, right? right, right. Uh, and I, I do wonder, uh, particularly about uh, Stephen Walcom's comments about fighting and these. You know, granola eating liberals who don't want fighting in the NHL, and and I, I again, I don't want to put you in an awkward position, right. but I'd be curious to know: do do you think that, like a lot of people, that the league and the officials' position on fighting has, at the very least, evolved, if not changed, in the seven, eight, or nine years since that email was sent? Well, you know, the game has evolved, and I mentioned, as you know, in in. Uh, those released documents and they were written in 2010 or 11 um, it's disappointing it personally when you read that sort of stuff about yourself and I saw it before I was deposed uh, and testified uh, I signed a, uh, a non-disclosure uh, order it's now public information uh, so people do think that this all of a sudden happened but it's you know it's something that I carried for for some time now and it, at the end of the day it's not about any one individual. It's not about Mr. Bettman and it's not about Kerry Fraser or any animosity that he might have for me. It's about the development and the movement that the league has made uh, that I hope they would make sooner when I 
talked about it and wrote about it on TSN and various articles, uh, a lot of posi positive articles uh, where the NHL has made good decisions and good calls through uh, player safety. Uh, and uh, Brendan Shanahan when he was there and now Stefan can tell. Uh, but it's, a, it's an evolutionary process. And I know that Mr. Bettman and Kerry Fraser want the same thing. We want players to be protected, but we also want good hard competition for the fans and for the game uh, that we all love. Um, and it, it's moving in the right direction. Uh, suspensions and players are more aware and the medical information is becoming uh, more attainable uh, as different studies are being done. So like the NFL, the NFL is moving in the, in the right direction on the issue. Uh, but I, I really believe that the Players Association has to be more actively involved. Those are the guys on the ice that they wear different uniforms uh, during the season, but in the summer they sit around the same table mm -hmm. as brethren. And they have to be more cognizant and active and work with the NHL to get this situation solved. Problem number one, players leave their skates. I've said it before for the last couple of years, you got to keep the players' skates on the ice. And that's where Stephen Wacom needs to be more proactive with the general managers and, and use officiating knowledge and insight and say, here's where it starts. It starts when the ankles flex, the knees bend, and then they stiffen. Because as I just did that, I'm coming up towards your head. That's where the problem starts, and that's where it could be finished. Gary Frazier, uh, you're, are you off to uh, you're off to Augusta? I'm going, over yeah, here to That's tomorrow, exciting. Is yeah. That, have, you, have you done that before? I've been twice. Uh, I'm working with my son-in-law. We have all access executive solutions and uh, golf travel, etc. Uh, so we're uh, we put a couple of hundred of uh, corporate people through uh, the Masters each day, VIPs. Uh, we have uh, four uh, beautiful uh, luxury suites on that Waste Management Phoenix Open Stadium hole number 16. Oh yeah, going to Ireland. To, you know, you're uh, got to be from the I'm, sod. I'm of Irish descent, I am, yeah. So in July, I'm taking a group over there for uh, to play the best of Ireland. Wow. That sounds amazing. Life all is good. Well, all right, Kerry. Thanks for your time, man. Thanks, Connor. That is Kerry Frazier of TSN Now, longtime NHL official. This is Hockey Prime Time. Uh, we are live from Chickies and Pete's in South Philly, and uh, we've got a lot of terrific guests joining us in the next little while, including our next one. Uh, we are going to be checking in with our friend Dave Isaac, who covers the Flyers for the South Jersey Courier Post. What's the future for Claude Giroux after his name popped up in trade rumors around deadline time? Dave's going to join us on the other side. We'll talk about that and more. This is Hockey Primetime on Sirius XM, NHL Network Radio, and streaming live at HockeyPrimetime.com. Did you guys last much longer there last night? No. Man, I crashed. Good spot, though. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and, I, and it also was nice out. It stopped. Uh, it stopped raining, so I got to walk home. Did you walk home after? <laughs> I did. Yeah, a lot Damage less. Damage was uh, already done by that yeah, point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Drenched. Yeah, you were soaked. <laughs> A little further than me. Is there? It's final. There's a basket. There's a final four game tonight. Is there? I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how much is it a is it a pain for you to get to uh, to get to the rink from here at a time like this? Only because people are like it's not far. No. I don't know if you know how close it is, but uh, just people trying to park. That's going to be the biggest issue. But it should right. be fine. I couldn't find a parking spot here. I just parked on the street across the street. Really, eh? Yeah. 
You, so uh, so what is, what's the scenario? I love the person correcting you on Twitter today. Well, technically, <laughs> oh, if they, oh, if every they day. lose regulation, all day, every day. Uh, I'm sorry, if they would yeah. lose in overtime, it's like, okay, man, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well done, sir. Thank you for that. <coughs> oh, I went to... Uh, I went to, uh, what's it called? Denix? Denix? Denix, Den yeah, yeah. Denix. I did the, uh, what did I do? Roast pork with uh, broccoli, broccoli rape. Rob? Yeah. Rob? Rob, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> See, that's more important than the cheesesteak. Yes. I, it was way better than the one I had yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Three, two, one. Welcome back. It's Hockey Primetime on Sirius XM NHL Network Radio and streaming live at HockeyPrimetime.com. I'm Connor McKenna. We are live at Chickies and Pete's in South Philly ahead of the uh, Devils taking on the Flyers tonight uh, for the, uh, I don't know if it's the last time this year. It might be the last time. Nope, with any second to last. Second to last uh, time. With uh, this time, there are some playoff implications. The, uh, I don't know if we'd say a snowball's chance in hell, but it's a pretty small chance that the Flyers make the playoffs at this point, but it's still technically possible unless they lose tonight in regulation, and that's combined with, oh, uh, well, let's see if my next guest can explain the scenarios to me. Dave Isaac from the South Jersey Courier Post. How you doing, man? Good, Connor. Good to see you, man. You as well, and thanks for making time for us here. Uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Claude Giroux, among uh, other things here. Uh, given the fact that for some reason in Montreal, I don't know how this happened, and it might have been because I was making jokes about it on my show, <laughs> but the rumor uh, site started writing, oh, Claude Giroux, or as they call him here, Claude Giroux, uh, is, uh, is, is, is going to be available. The Flyers might be willing to trade Claude Giroux. And I'm thinking, oh, there's no way. Why, why would the Flyers trade Claude Giroux? He's the captain. He's the face of their team. But uh, do you think, I mean, is there anything to something like that? Should there be anything to something like that? Hitting the reset button when it comes to Claude Giroux? Oh, clearly it's because we can't pronounce his first name. <laughs> I think that, that's the biggest thing. Uh, I'm just, I happen to be from the <laughs> same part of the world as him, so I, I say his name a certain way. No, I don't think there was ever any real shot that the Flyers are going to trade uh, Claude Giroux. Has he had a great year? Absolutely not. Has he had a good year? No. But uh, I think especially recently it's become more and more prevalent that it, it this is because of the, the surgery that he had last year. And Shane Gostisbehere had the same one. And uh, neither of those guys are really willing to admit it until recently. Right. Um, and Drew's still the only one that does. Hmm. But uh, he, both of them had matching surgeries in the same day. And Drew said, yeah, I'm finally starting to skate a little bit better. And you can see it with him, too. Wow. So the, the, the fact that he's you know willing to go out on a limb, and, and it, it, it shows. I mean, he, he is starting to skate a little bit better. And the same for Gostisbehere. He's got two moves that are both really predominantly with his feet and he wasn't making them for the first several months of the season he says it's a confidence thing that's why that's the way he tries to to duck it a little bit but uh, i think it, it looks like it's with his skating and and the captain is is kind of the same way there what was the surgery sorry since i it was uh, abdominal and hip surgery okay wow yeah, my, my mom, uh, my 72-year-old mother had uh, a, a similar hip uh, situation. And I'm sure her skating ago. is much better <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, uh, exactly. And so Gostaspear, that's interesting because he has had kind of, compared to the electrifying season that he put together right. a year ago, an underwhelming season, although there have been some flashes lately, as you mentioned, right? He's been a big part of what was such a good power play, all of a sudden scoring some goals for the first time in like a month. Yeah, and, and if it really is the surgery and he just doesn't admit it, I, I wish he would because the coach sat him as a healthy scratch the one game and you're going, wow, that seems a little odd to do yeah. because even though the whole team wasn't playing well at that point, he's one of the defensemen that gives him an offensive punch and he needed one. And also his game was not where it should have been, but the games, several games before that, he was starting to trend in the right direction again. So for him to kind of stop that progress there was a little suspicious and then he did it again. Uh, for four more games later in the season. So uh, I, I think that it, that probably has something to do with it there. And, and he is starting to come around now, but as the Flyers have won three in a row, too little too late. How much of a game changer would a healthy Gostaspear, do you, do you think? I mean, it's all hypothetical at this point, but even going sure. into next year, how much of a difference would that have made for this team wire to wire? Well, the, the fact that last year he was a rookie almost makes it look like now, do you know who the real Shane Gostaspear is? And, and if it is because of the surgery, then you would lean more towards last year being the real Shane Goss despair. Uh, was that an off-the-charge rookie season? Absolutely. He was second in Calder voting. But a healthy Shane Goss despair would have made a huge difference this year. And, and next year, I think you'll see part of it. But also, there, there's going to be a lot of turnover on the Flyers' defense. Uh, 
uh, next season, too. I think you'll see two new rookies there. Okay, and, uh, and some pretty exciting prospects as well, right? Uh, so who are, the, who are the two? Well, I think Travis Sanheim is probably a, a stone-cold lock at this point. Okay. The other one, I, I'm, I'm just saying two based on the, the pending free agents that they have. Um, I don't think that that second one is, is cemented yet. Samuel Moran, who is uh, a first-round pick that has had a lot of question marks around him, uh, is, is certainly possible. And Philip Myers, who is on the Team Canada World Junior team, I think the only member of that team that was undrafted. Uh, the, the Flyers picked him up as a free agent uh, after having him in for, for training camp two years ago. So uh, I think those are probably the two biggest candidates at this point. But they're sure going to get faster and younger and, and more exciting. Better? We'll see. Right. And, and another question is who might they be protecting, right? Who's going to be the last line of defense for the Flyers next year? And uh, this is something you and I were talking about uh, off the air uh, when we were hanging out yesterday yeah. here. Uh, what do you think? I mean, uh, who do you think is going to be the man in goal for the Flyers next year? I, I would say right now I think the highest probability, and I don't know that it's particularly high, but the highest one in my mind is Ben Bishop. Um, I, I think that the Flyers have ticked off Steve Mason's camp to the point where I don't know if they can uh, bring him back. And I, I really believe, even though Michael Neuber is the one with the contract extension and he's getting the start tonight, which I believe has more to do with Steve Mason's career splits against New Jersey, the only team he's never beaten, uh, than anything else. I, I have nothing to back this up, but I believe that there's uh, a deal in place there with, with wow. Vegas. Well, and, and, and so, okay. Uh, and, and those numbers you just referred to, it's a zero, nine, and two. So zero wins in 11 decisions and an 8.52 save percentage for Steve Mason against the, the uh, Devils. This obviously predates his, even his Flyers career, uh, you, you'd right. have to think, right? When he was a Columbus Blue Jacket, he probably lost a couple yeah. against the Devils. That's crazy, though, isn't it? It is, and I think you reach a certain point where it, it gets in his head. I had asked about it, um, you know, the day before a game a, a year or so ago, and, and I could tell he wasn't happy. And then last year, I remember asking it, and he was... I just walked up to him this year, and I said, so you don't want me to ask? And before I could even finish, he goes, no. <laughs> so he, he knows exactly what, what tree I was barking up, and, and he, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that he's uh, aware of, and I think that even though there's so much adrenaline and you get, you know, zeroed in when you're, you're out on the ice, I think it's something that's in his head, and, and if he were out there, it would kind of be a cloud above his head, unless, unless he had a five-goal first period support like he did the other night. And it's one of those awkward beat writer-athlete interactions, too, where it's like, you have to ask that question, and right. it's also like, well, what's he going to say? Right. Well, you know what? There's, there's a mental block in place, you know what I mean? Like, right. they're, they're in my head. Nobody's going to say that. They probably shouldn't blame me. Oh, exactly. <laughs> I mean, no, no pro athlete is going right. to admit that. Heck, I mean, I, I don't know if I'd want to admit that about anything. Uh, all right, uh, another one that I know you wrote about today. Colin McDonald called up by the Flyers. Uh, the timing of this, a little bit interesting. Uh, what do you think it, it could or might mean for uh, Roman L Lubimov? Lubi yeah. Lubimov? Lubimov is what we... Lubimov. Yeah, we, we've gone with both this okay. year. But, uh, well, Lubimov's a guy who, who's been around in a healthy stretch for the, the majority of the season. In the times that he has been, and we're talking about a fourth-line right winger role. Like, this isn't, you know, a... a, a position where the Flyers are looking for skill and a, and a couple of goals every night. Uh, I think that it, it probably means that Lubimov is, is done, but it's just strange because the coach is, has applauded him all year and says that he's in great shape and does a great job, but then he doesn't play him, so uh, he's kind of talking out of both sides of his mouth there. But the, the reason why this is a, a little bit of a, a brow raiser is because the f minor league team, the Phantoms, are close to making a, a playoff spot, right. uh, close to clinching there, and to take McDonald away, who's their captain, and scored 23 goals for him this season. Why? <laughs> I mean, it, it, obviously the, the goal is to make the NHL team as great as possible, even if their postseason hopes are hanging by a thread, half a thread, right. whatever it is. Uh, but they also had other bodies here, too. So well, I, I, I don't get it. And I know your public stance, especially, right, the players will keep saying, oh, yeah, you know, we're, we're gunning for the playoffs. The coach is going to say it. Ron Hextel is going to say it. But come on. These, these guys are realists just like the rest of us. It's not even so much that they have to catch the Bruins as that there's Tampa, there's the Islanders, there's, there's just a bunch of teams that statistically have a, a better, and even those teams have a pretty slim chance, right? I mean, it's, right. come on, if we're putting our cards on the table here, we know the Flyers are not going to make the playoffs this year. So you're right. I mean, the, the, that does seem strange because right. the fa you want the Phantoms. Hey, how about all these young guys, the guys you're talking about too, uh, guys who might be a part of this team next year, it could be invaluable to have them go on a run. And, and the other part of it is 
Colin McDonald probably should have been in that spot all along. So part of the question is, well, why didn't you just do it in October then? Right. Uh, because he's a guy that, you know, he's been in the league a while and, and doesn't have uh, the same scoring pedigree in the NHL that he does the AHL, but he's got better hands than uh, a couple of the guys that are on that fourth better line right now. Better than Robin Lubimov? Uh, yeah, a little bit yeah. better than Roman that's Lubimov. Okay. That's all right. You can say it. Certainly better than Chris Vandevelde, who has played every game of the season because he's a great penalty killer. But, Or, you know, the coach thinks he's a great penalty killer. But Wayne Simmons has scored 30 goals for the Flyers, and he's their top penalty killer. Right. So you can have pretty much anybody kill penalties for you. I saw an April Fool's joke today. Uh, uh, Chris Stoff Vandevelde rewarded with lifetime contract. And yeah. uh, <laughs> a lot of angry comments uh, that were put on it by uh, Flyers fans. <laughs> uh, Dave, thanks for your time, man. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Thanks for yeah, coming by. See that is Dave Isaac of the uh, South... Jersey Courier Post is joining me here. This is Hockey Prime Time on Sirius XM, NHL Network Radio, and streaming live at HockeyPrimeTime.com. Joining us next, Stephanie Driver, Broad Street Hockey. We're going to keep the Flyers talk going. They did it. Uh, they looked pretty good the other night. Why can't the Flyers just do that every night? What they did to the Islanders the other night. We'll talk to Stephanie next. This is Hockey Prime Time on Sirius XM, NHL Network Radio, and streaming live at HockeyPrimeTime.com. Uh, are you going to the game tonight? I'm not. Okay. Yeah, me neither. That's okay. Do you? The podcast? Okay, that's Yellow Boat Sports or Broad Street Hockey Radio? Oh, really? Cool. All right. Okay. Cool. That's, uh, that's, that's something to record your podcast at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock on a Saturday night. I mean, yeah. what kind of a podcast is it? Okay. Okay. Uh, Dave was telling me yesterday that it's like it's all Eagles here. It is, eh? I guess it's kind of like that everywhere with football, though. But yeah, always. Uh, sorry, Jesse, you said 30 seconds there? Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I, uh, I was, we were going to do, Sarah Baker was going to be on with us in the first hour here. So I had, basically, we were going to do four straight Flyers segments. So I have this much Flyers stuff. Awesome. And I didn't use any of this, which is good. Cool. Three, two, one. Welcome back. This is Hockey Primetime. We're live from Chickies and Pete's in South Philly with a crab fry poutine in front of us. We got great drink specials here as well. Very affordable uh, beverages, and I, I have it all written down here somewhere. Uh, I don't know. I, I can't find it. I have too many pieces of paper. Oh, here we go. Uh, wow. Uh, $5 personal pitchers, two fifty drafts, $3 bottles, all on Labatt. Uh, big thank you to Labatt for uh, getting on board and being such a great part of this. Uh, this is an exciting time, although the Flyers, uh, I don't know. Uh, they got to <laughs> win this one tonight, that's for sure. Uh, joining us right now from Broad Street Hockey, Stephanie Driver. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for making time for us. I appreciate it. And uh, I mean, look, I said, uh, Dave just said, hanging by a very, very thin thread of uh, the playoff hopes. Are, have you have you given up on, a long on time playoff ago. hockey? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's okay. That's just where they are this season. Is it, 
it's it's got to be frustrating, and, and <laughs> I know a lot of teams do this, but to see the way they played the Islanders the other night and yeah. what they did, and I'm sure you know part of that could be the Islanders doing what they've been doing lately, but right. they're capable of looking really good, of having a good power play and doing the things that we've become accustomed to the Flyers doing in the last few years, but it seems <laughs> like two out of every three games they're not. Yeah, it's a little too late, huh? Um, what happened, I think, against the Islanders is this this season they've had just really terrible puck luck. And that was one game where that's what it looks like when the luck goes your way. Right. So it was a whole season's worth of puck luck catching up. So looking now, if, if we are willing to sort of write off the playoff chances. And I think that that's fair. That's fine. <laughs> we, can, we can do that here. Uh, so where do you think this team is at overall? If, if we're looking oh. at the, the pool of prospects and, yeah. and the coach, the general manager, the guys that they have, the veteran presence that they have, where do you think the Flyers are at, say, if you're looking at the next five years? The next five years, I think they're in really good shape. What, what's the most concerning to me right now is the coach, followed by potentially the GM. Um, I think that the, the team that they have right now, they're okay. The prospects that we have coming up will s save our defense at minimum. Um, but in the next five years, they're in pretty good shape. They're going to need to find a number one center to replace Claude Giroux. We don't have that in our system right now. Who does? No one. Right. <laughs> uh, that's a, that's, I mean, that's a, no, if, you, if you have a guy like that in your system, he's playing on your team already, exactly. right? Those guys go jump straight into the uh, National Hockey League. Exactly. Uh, Austin Matthews style. Uh, so Hackstall and Hextall. Yes. Uh, and so why then, why was D Dave Hackstall the first thing you mentioned? So I'm, I'm really confused about what he's done this season. So it's wildly different than what he came in and did last season. Uh, the system doesn't really seem to work with the team that we have. And he's made a lot of really questionable choices that seem small individually. But when you add them all up over a season, it, it's confusing. How much did, and I mentioned this with Bill when he was on, but that 10-game mm -hmm. winning streak, and everybody's yeah. talking about the Flyers, and I remember at the time just saying, like, I, I, <laughs> I'm not buying it. I'm watching these games. They're losing 4-2 in the third period. They pop two yeah. quick goals. They win it in overtime or a shootout, and they did that, like, 10 times in a row. Yeah. But that, that also, a 10-game streak, which is amazing for sure, but it glossed over or at the very least masked maybe some bigger issues with this yeah. team, didn't it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But that's what Philadelphia is about. Philadelphia is about the, the scrappy team that's always fighting back to win. So the fact that that happened was exactly what the city needed. And then it was, well, the team is <laughs> a little bit overperforming. And I think the playoff run from last year also inflated our expectations for this year. Right. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, I guess you, you, you do also have the goodwill generated by Shane Gossespierre. Absolutely. Who was so good last year. Yeah. It seemed like every night he did something gift-worthy. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, you know, which is the, the 2016, yeah, 2017 yep. way of saying a highlight reel-worthy yep, yep. move. Had these leaping stops of the pocket. Nobody can keep a puck in the zone in a more exciting way than Shane Gossespierre. He's electric to watch. And now we're seeing signs that maybe the down season, the sophomore slump right. that went on may be a thing of the past. That's got to be a, a little bit encouraging. Um, yeah, I don't, I wasn't ever really concerned about him. He's a player that you've got to give him the freedom to be creative. He's, he's got to have a lot of movement on the ice. He's got to have a lot of, a, a, a lot of creativity, really a lot of space to do what he does. That was limited a little bit earlier this season. Then he went through a handful of scratches, which I'm sure didn't help with his confidence. Right. Um, but now he, he seems to be back to form from last year. I, I wasn't worried. I, I figured he would come back. Talking just now with Dave Isaac, yep. uh, he mentioned Ben Bishop as somebody that he thinks the Flyers are going to target and, and may end up with as their goaltender oh next God. year. What I, do you think about that I would. I don't want that, only because he's, he's going to want a long contract. And with the goalie prospects that we have in the system, we have a handful. Um, it just doesn't make sense to give someone a five-year, seven-year contract, especially when you're Ben Bishop. He's 31. I think that's it, right, rough, yeah. Roughly. Yeah, he's been traded a lot of times already in his career, too. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a good goaltender. He's big. They don't tend to hold up very well either, so injury risk is already a problem with both of the goalies that we have now. Um, actually, right before I came on, we got word that Steve Mason is ill, so... Uh, Neuvert is starting, and um, Anthony Stolarz has been called up from the Phantoms. Right. But it, it, we have we have enough prospects in the system. If we 
the ideal for me would have been to keep Steve Mason for two years. Now it's Neuvert for two years. Right. We'll and see. Although uh, Dave says he thinks, uh, or it wasn't Dave, it was, uh, it was Bill Clement who brought it up first, uh, that there's a pretty good chance that Michael Neuvert ends up claimed by Las Vegas in the that's, expansion draft. That's the new rumor, and I can't believe that. I understand why people are saying it, but it, it just doesn't compute. Like, <laughs> why, would, like, why would George right. McPhee want to do that? Right. Like he, I know that he drafted him, but he also traded him away. That's true, yes. So why... I. I just don't. I don't get it. If he does, that's great. Cool. Yeah, and the, and then you wonder what it might mean uh, for Steve Mason and exactly. his future. So who do you think? If if you're if you got to put some money on the table, who's the Flyers' number one goalie next year? Oh, I probably Neuvert. Yeah. Yeah, that that's that would be my that would be my guess, and I, I don't feel really confident going into next season with that being a, Neuvert and Stolarz is our tandem. But right, if that's what they're gonna do. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, that is, uh, but most teams don't have good goaltending, right? Like, how many teams really have good goaltending? Think of the Canadians, the Capitals, yep. uh, the Rangers, although Henrik Lundqvist has not looked great this no. year. No. Uh, and and uh, other than that, Corey Crawford, okay, so the Blackhawks, uh, the question marks at virtually every other team in the National Hockey sure. League. Maybe the Penguins, although even again, yeah, who who's it going to be? Okay, it's Matt Murray. That's Can a really the load? fun question for the off season. But what's it's, going on there? I, you know, I, I, that's the thing that I think you have to remember is that there's really there's probably three or four teams that have elite goaltending. Yep. Then there's maybe seven or eight teams that have good goaltending, Passable. and then there's like yep. 18 teams that have mediocre or uh, okay goaltending. I don't know what that noise was <laughs> that I just heard. I hope we're still on the air. Uh, hey, tell me about your uh, podcast. You've got uh, Broad Street Hockey Radio. Yes. Uh, start there. What's up? Yeah, Broad Street Hockey Radio. Uh, it's on Monday nights. You can also find us on BroadStreetHockey.com. It's me uh, and Bill Matz, Kelly Hinkle, and Charlie O'Connor. We talk about the Flyers for an hour every week. Um, and then I do Yelling About Sports with Bill Matz. It's Yelling About Sports with Bill and Steph, and we cover all of the things and all of the sports that make us angry. Is hockey your favorite uh, sport to yell about? It is, yeah. yeah. Followed yeah. by? Football is really easy to yell about. Yeah. <laughs> it's really easy to get angry by the stuff that's happening in the NFL. Well, and, and uh, I know that there's probably a lot of the Eagles fans listening right now here at Chickies and Pete's and, uh, and uh, online and, yeah. uh, and on the radio. Uh, what do you think, uh, Carson Wentz? Is is he the guy? Is, I think is, he is. Yeah. I think he is. I think he's got to be. If yeah, I know else. he's got to be. <laughs> but I don't know if that means that he will be. Uh, we'll see. I see people talking about him like he's the next Tom Brady. It's like, I don't know. Well, we get a little crazy here. Right. <laughs> Stephanie, thank you for your time. I thank appreciate it. Thank you so much. It. That's Stephanie Driver of Broad Street Hockey uh, joining us here on uh, Hockey Primetime on Sirius XM uh, NHL Network Radio, also streaming live at uh, HockeyPrimetime.com. Uh, our next guest is uh, going to be joining us in uh, just a few minutes. Uh, what are we doing? Oh, I've got so many pages of notes. Matt Laughlin's going to be joining us. Uh, Patrick Eliash hangs him up. Is his uh, next stop in the Hall of Fame? Well, let's talk a little bit of Devils. I'm sorry. We have to do it. It can't be all Flyers talk. This is Hockey Primetime on Sirius XM NHL Network Radio, streaming live at HockeyPrimetime.com. We are done this hour of the show. Was that the – I think we're off the air now, yeah. Uh, all right. Thank you. Did that work okay? I didn't realize we were that close. I heard 30. I heard 30. And then that was that was all I heard. Thank you. Thanks for coming by. Cheers. Have a good night. Do you know when you're on? 690? I would have probably played today. Hockey Prospect Radio? Yeah. Huh? 6 o'clock. Is it you and Laura? Or? It's Matt Law.
Laughlin. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Laughlin? Laughlin. Laughlin. Thank you. Hey, man. Good, you? Do you do, was it today at TFC you were at? Oh, it was yesterday? Did, what happened? Did they win? I'm, I'm totally uh, I'm totally out of loop. Yeah, good old soccer. Uh, the impact tied again. Oh, good God. Yeah, that noise tripped me out, Chris. Like, that, did that not sound like a something just crashed kind of noise? This is uh, kind of a last second ask, but there's no chance you have any uh, Patrick Eliash tape or anything, do you? vacation. Yeah, sure. Did you see the two with his, the cutest two little kids behind here when uh, Carrie Frazier was on? Yeah, it was very funny. Oh boy, so we got a ball game here, eh? All right, three, two, one. All right, welcome back. It's hour number two. This is Hockey Prime Time. We're live at Chickies and Pete's in South Philly, home of the crab fries. We've got a crab fry poutine in front of us. We've got great deals on uh, Labatt Blue, uh, specials all night long on uh, Blue and Blue Light, uh, $5 personal pitchers, $2.50 drafts, $3 bottles. Get her done, and I can't wait. I am very excited. I'm looking at the menu. I've got the... Uh, list of crustaceans that made Chickies and Pete's famous, and I am going to eat crab legs when we are done here at 7 o'clock. Oh yes, I will eat crab legs uh, later on tonight. Can't wait for that. How uh, about we got work to do between uh, now and then, and uh, what a story we have uh, with the New Jersey Devils. You know what? Kind of nice, uh, given that it's been a little bit of an underwhelming season from a devil standpoint, that uh, one of the greatest devils of all time, we learned, is going to hang them up, and uh, will skate with his well, not teammates anymore, but uh, certainly a lot of his colleagues one last time next Saturday night at the Prudential Center in New Jersey. Uh, that's where our next guest plies his trade, 41 games a year, and that's it this year because uh, no playoff games. His name is Matt Lachlan. He is the voice of the Devils on uh, WFAN 660. Matt, welcome to the show. And, and a great player, right? This is, this is maybe, and I'm not sure, and I'm sure that the, there's a debate to be had here, but the greatest Devils forward ever? And 
with two cups, with a thousand points, with the playoff track record that he has, in your mind, next stop, Hall of Fame? How much, how cool is that too? In, in this day and age, you talk about guys like Yager and Neuendijk and Stasny, guys who didn't uh, play their entire career with one team. And, and look, only so many people can do that. I understand and I'm not trying to knock guys who don't. But there is something special about a guy who spends his entire career wearing the same uniform, isn't there? So uh, he will get a chance to skate in the warm-up uh, next Saturday and uh, and be honored by the Devils, which is uh, something pretty cool and a, and a nice little way of, uh, of honoring him, isn't it? Are uh, you looking forward to that? No kidding, uh, and uh, one last time before it ends up a race to the rafters there at the uh, Prudential Center, uh, where it, it hasn't exactly been a banner season for the Devils. Why do you think that is? And I'm sure there's a, there's a list of reasons, and I'm sure you've spent your share, t uh, share of time talking about them this year, Matt. Uh, but uh, nutshell, why have things gone badly for the Devils this year? We're talking Devils with uh, Matt Lachlan, who is the voice of the Devils on uh, WFAN 660. You'll be able to hear his uh, call of the game tonight. In Philly, it's the uh, Flyers and the Devils. That's a 7 o'clock, roughly 7 o'clock uh, puck drop. The actual dropping of the puck will occur shortly after 7 o'clock. And uh, the uh, the Devils' uh, big move in the offseason, and uh, this was always going to be significant, was uh, trading Adam Larson. And that was the last time they had a, a you know pretty high draft pick. And he's... He was a good player. I don't know if he ever was a great player. And he's had a solid season in Edmonton. They've been happy. Uh, how has Taylor Hall been? How do you rate that trade nine months later?
went over the top. I think they've got a guy, I don't know his name, Connor McDavid, leading the way. But uh, I think he's been an integral part of what they've been able to do, become more defensive-minded. But Taylor Hall does use a double through stall in scoring. He is by far their most gifted and talented player. I think he's in a transition year, so it's not paid off the way the Devils have hoped. But I think that they would make that trade every time it came up. It feels like we're pretty far removed from the Lou Lamarillo uh, Stanley Cup years with the Devils. Do you think that uh, this is a team that needs to bottom out? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, we've never seen we've never seen this team do this in the last couple of decades, but. Do they have to sort of bottom out for a year or two? I, I don't know if we want to call it a tank, but is that sort of what needs to happen if they do want to truly reboot and reset the franchise? Well, I think that's what's happening. No, it's not a tank because uh, whoever is the number one pick is not considered to be on the same level as the one of the uh, And so it's not a tank to get a generational player, but it's an understanding that you have more power And, and it is amazing what you say there about the draft this year. You know, there was Connor McDavid a couple of years ago. There was Austin Matthews and Patrick Laine last year. But the fact is, and you can ask the Chicago Blackhawks and the Edmonton Oilers about this, if you want to do that, you have to bottom out at the right time. And, and a lot of that is luck. You can just as easily end up with Ryan Nugent Hopkins as you can end up with Patrick Kane. Uh, so on and so forth and that's it right now we don't even really have a consensus about who the number one pick is going to be this year which probably tells you a lot doesn't mean there's not going to be a lot of good players in the draft this year uh, but it does mean there isn't a guy who's going to change the complexion of a franchise completely the way Matthews has done in Toronto this year the way that Connor McDavid did in Edmonton last year right so uh, that's the thing you, 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 you run the risk of sort of bottoming out at the wrong time and having it not make the the correct difference and, and sort of you just stay treading water. I mean, there's there's got to be a real danger of that happening, isn't there? Well, I think so. You have to look at the fact that there are some good players. I think this crap, we have Mike Cordell, who covers the doubles for NHL.com, but also is someone who takes a particular eye on the draft. And Paul, a junior hockey. And he said that because there's no generational player, as there has been recently, this draft has gotten a bad name. Well, no, there might not be that guy who single-handedly can get your fan base excited, bring the fans to the edge of their seat every time you touch the puck. That doesn't mean there's not somebody who cannot become a 20 to 25 goal scorer on a regular basis in a league where that's a pretty good number anymore. And that kind of player can help the devil. So it may not be some of the great names that have been available recently. And that's a bit of an aberration. If you look through some of the drafts in the past, yeah, there'll be a guy that I think will look back at but a good long-term NHL player, he's there. The Devils will start to rebuild from that. Matt, I know you got work to do. Uh, thank you for making time for us before the game tonight. Enjoy it. Enjoy the stretch run, and I hope we can chat again soon. That sounds great, and uh, enjoy the crowd here. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. That is uh, Matt Lachlan, the voice of the Devils on WFAN 660. Uh, the Devils in action tonight against the Flyers. The uh, Flyers looking to keep their playoff hopes alive. And the uh, Devils, well, looking to ruin them. Uh, the numbers are crazy. The Devils have outscored the Flyers 14-3 to this year. 
Uh, they've beaten up on them every time they've met, and they've still got two games against them this year. Uh, the Flyers are going to have to figure that out and uh, maybe took a step in the right direction. As we learned, well, it's not going to be Steve Mason tonight. Apparently he's sick. I don't know if this is kind of like the Flyers flu. Remember the Flyers used to come to town in the heyday of the Broad Street Bullies and other teams, players would come down with the flu, the Flyers flu. They didn't want to play against the Broad Street Bullies. I don't know if maybe that's what happened with Steve Mason here a little bit. A little bit of Devil's flu, 0-9-2 in his career against the uh, the uh, New Jersey Devils. Maybe he said, you know what, maybe we'll, uh, we'll leave this one to Michael Neuvers tonight. Coming up next, uh, we are going to be chatting with uh, our executive producer and our producer. I want to talk to Laura Saba and Sam Wu, find out what's going on with them. We're live from Chickies and Pete's. This is Hockey Primetime on Sirius XM, NHL Network Radio, and streaming live at HockeyPrimetime.com. Wow, was that music coming in hot. Wow. Could you hear me? You could hear me over that music, yeah? Holy shit. 19, uh, 19 people. All right. Now we're going to talk about, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Devils. We'll talk about the event, the venue. We'll talk to Laura in Montreal, see what's going on up there. Hi there. Uh, until we do the raffle? Probably Do it like 6.30? Yes. Okay. Who? Okay. Are we gonna, how are we going to do it? I'm going to do it? Okay. Sure. Well, why don't we do it? Yeah. I mean, we should do it. If we're going to do it, we should do it now. What was that? What? Oh. Oh, I see. Nothing, I don't know, they're doing something on the technical side here. What? Yeah, okay. The pucks? What's going on? Uh, yeah, hey. Hey, what's up? My computer keeps freezing. I can't, can't hear you. Uh, sorry. Oh, that's not good. Okay. That I can hear you now. Are you still there? Well, yeah, yeah, you sound good. Okay. Perfect. All right. So what, it didn't work with the thing or whatever? I don't even know. I, I, don't, I don't even want to know. I, I don't even want to know. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. <coughs> Didn't we do this song already? All right. Three, two, one. Hey, welcome back. This is Hockey Primetime live from Chickies and Pete's South Philly. Uh, we've got our uh, get, we got the raffle coming up momentarily. We've got a Claude Giroux signed puck, a Chris Pronger signed puck, a Daniel Briere signed puck. We will raffle those off in the next few minutes, and uh, and uh, very much looking forward to that. My name is Connor McKenna. I'm the host of Hockey Primetime. We're live at Chickies and Pete's in South Philadelphia. Uh, we're about th 45 minutes away from the uh, Flyers and the New Jersey Devils. On site with me here is the executive producer of Hockey Primetime, Sam Wu. Sam, welcome to the show. Thank you, Connor. It's, uh, it's jumping here. There's a lot of people uh, waiting out the door. There's people waiting just, just to see the show. and Of course. Yeah. Uh, they're all here to see yeah, the show. Yes, Sam. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, you've also got South Carolina taking on Gonzaga, Final Four. Uh, you've got, as we mentioned, you got the Flyers game tonight as they take on the New Jersey Devils. The Devils have owned the Flyers. Sam Wu, I mean, I don't want to put you in an awkward position here. We are surrounded by Orange. But uh, New Jersey Devils season ticket holder, big fan of the Devils, right? You know, it's been a lousy year, but when you, when you play the Flyers, somehow they have their number. Right. I, that, I don't get it. That's the sometimes the silver lining as a sports fan is your team can have a nightmare season, but they can somehow own a huge advantage over a rival. They've outscored them 14-3 to and beat them every time this year. And didn't they end their 10-game winning streak? They did. It, you know, yeah. back, back earlier in the year? 
Yeah, with emphatically, like yep. in, a, in a blowout uh, game. Uh, we've also got the producer of the show. Her name is Laura Savage. She's on with us here. Laura, can you hear us? I can. How are you guys? I, I, I can sort of hear her, but not really. Laura, are you there? I am here. Can you I hear me now? I don't know if that's going to work. Uh, Chris, I'm not sure if you can hear it, but I can barely hear it. I don't think that's... Laura, one more time. Uh, hi. Hey, there we go. All right. Uh, nice to hear Perfect. your voice. And uh, you're in Montreal, I know, but we figured it was very important that we bring you in on the show uh, and find out what's going on up there. Uh, wh wh what do we have going on? Is it winter? Is it still winter in Montreal? It, it, yeah, I had to clean snow off my car this morning. Oh, and no. I just jealous. Yes, are you, are you and okay? I was so jealous of you to be away from the snow, yeah. but also because they made you a crab fry poutine, and I don't get to taste that. It's Yeah, and you know what? To be fair, I didn't really get to taste it either. It, it arrived right as we were going on the air. I did take a couple of bites. It was delicious. Uh, the crab fries are very good. Uh, we're going to have to get you down here next time to try the uh, crab fry poutine, which I am now holding in my hands and demonstrating for everybody watching on uh, Facebook Live, Periscope, Periscope. and uh, beyond. Hello, everybody. And, uh, yeah, we're live here at uh, Chickies and Pete's in uh, South Philly, having a great time. And uh, I think we should probably auction these things off. Auction. We're not auctioning them off. We're raffling them raffling. off. Raffling. Uh, so if we I, – I could auction them off, too. I mean, that'd be fine. I, I need to pay for my cab back to the hotel somehow. Uh, but let's do it here. All right, we're going to start it off with the uh, Claude Giroux sign puck. Flyers captain, Claude Giroux. Uh, we're doing the raffle now, so if you have raffle tickets, please hold them in hand. Uh, so you can find out whether or not you won, all right? Uh, I'm going to pull the ticket, and the lovely Sam over here is going to read the number. Here we go. Your first winner for the Claude Giroux puck. Numbers 1, 9, 7, 3, 3, 2, 4. That's 1, 9, 7, 3, 3, 2, 4. If we uh, have a winner come up to the front, you've won the Claude Giroux sign puck. That's our first winner in the raffle, we've got another one for you right now. That is the Danny Briere sign puck, or as we call him in Montreal, Daniel Briere, uh, the uh, sign puck. Uh, all right, uh, that is your second raffle winner, and that number is one nine seven three two nine one. That is one nine seven three two nine one. That is for the Daniel Briere sign puck. You can come up and uh, claim the prize if you have your ticket. Uh, if not, we'll draw again. And uh, finally. And this is my favorite one. It is the Chris Pronger cross-check to the head sign puck. Uh, <laughs> number 20, signed by uh, Chris Pronger. And uh, your winner for this one is this ticket right here. Let's see the number. One, nine, seven, three, three, four, seven. One, nine, seven, three, three, four, seven for the Chris Pronger sign puck. Uh, so if we have any winners, you can come forward. Uh, perhaps you're too deep in your crab fries and, uh, and the Labatt, Labatt Blue specials. Uh, in which case uh, we will have to uh, draw again. So we'll give it a couple of minutes. If nobody comes up to claim them, uh, we'll pull new tickets for the uh, raffle winners uh, with Sam Wu and Laura Saba up on uh, site in Montreal. Uh, so I checked out Philadelphia a little bit. Uh, had a chance to do that. I figured I was here. I was staying downtown right next to the uh, Reading Terminal Market. I had to go check that out. Had a great sandwich. Everyone tells me about the cheesesteak. Oh, you got to eat the cheesesteak. I must say roast pork sandwich may be of a similar or higher caliber than a Philly cheesesteak. <laughs> I don't know if that's a sacrilege to say, uh, but really, really good. I went to see the Liberty Bell, uh, which was very cool. I'd never done that before, uh, so I had a chance to uh, check that out and went to uh, Independence Hall across the street to see where they uh, they signed the Declaration of Independence, wow. which was also very cool. I mean, you got to do stuff yep. like this. Like Philadelphia used to be the capital, right? It, for a time, was the biggest city in the United States, yep. uh, and it was nice to be able to take in uh, some of that history, and the people have been great. Super cool. Uh, everybody's been super nice. Uh, everybody here at Chickies and Pete's. So we've had a really, really nice time. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, I, I can't say any, enough good things about Philly. The only thing is, there's only so many sandwiches I can eat between now and my flight less than 24 hours from now. I've got about 22 hours. That means I probably got maybe one, maybe two sandwiches left in me before I leave. I'm going to have you to make it You try the count. lobster tails here. They're, they're amazing. I will. I will. <laughs> I'm going to have some crab legs. We'll try some lobster tails uh, here at Chickies and Pete's. And nobody's claimed any of the pucks. Are we? Nobody's waiting. All right, so we're going to do it again. We will draw. Sorry, do you have a winning ticket? No. no. She would like a winning pot. She does not have a winning <laughs> ticket. You're halfway there. All right, so let's do it again. No winners. You're a winner. All right, come on up there. Yes, oh, you and your which, which one orange T-shirt. Which one? Uh, the, third one? the third one was the Chris Pronger puck. That is, or no, 4-7. All right, you've got the Claude Giroux puck. Congratulations. 
Claude Giroux puck for the man here. Actually, can you give me the tickets? Uh, and we'll get a picture with the lovely Labatt Blue uh, ladies over here and the Labatt Blue man uh, who is standing there with them as well. All right, uh, so we do have one winner. We still have two unclaimed. Uh, so going once, going twice, no? Okay, let's do it again. Uh, we've got the Chris Pronger puck first. This ticket is gone. I'm drawing a new ticket for the Chris Pronger sign puck. The number is 197-3299. 197-3299 for a signed Chris Pronger puck. If you have that raffle ticket, please come up to the front uh, and uh, we'll do a new one here for the uh, Daniel Briere signed puck or Danny Briere signed puck. That is 197-3345. 197-3345. I'm sorry, but a very sad looking Flyers fan over there and I just dropped the uh, sign puck on the floor. Uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, all right, uh, we're live with you here from Chickies and Pete's in uh, South Philly a couple minutes ago. Uh, so yeah, the uh, tonight in the National Hockey League. Laura, are you there? I am. Laura's still there. Okay, so it's the Canadians taking on the Tampa Bay Lightning. Uh, the Lightning trying to stay alive. This is a big one. I was thinking that maybe we were going to get Steven Stamkos back in the, flyer, in the, uh, in the Tampa lineup tonight. That's not going to happen. Uh, also, Tyler Johnson not going to get into that uh, lineup tonight. Uh, it looks like they're going to be back at some point, but they're going to be playing the Canadians, who don't have a whole lot to play for. I guess they want the division. Uh, and, and I know this is something we talked about last week. The Habs have been winning games, but Laura, is it important at all that they win the division, that they finish the season strong? That means a, a showdown with the Rangers in the playoffs. If they don't win the division, they get the Leafs or the Sens most likely in the playoffs. An outside chance they get the Lightning. Uh, what do you think? Uh, do you want to see them coast uh, for the last couple of games and not care about the division, or finish strong, win the division, and get the Rangers? Personally, as a fan, I would like them to coast just because it's, there's no point in, in getting injured at this point in the season if you want to get gear up for a long playoff run. Uh, and at the same time, you know, as a fan, you would like to face a rival like the Sens or the Leafs or something like that. Um, it didn't go so well the last time they played the Rangers in the playoffs. Uh, hopefully, they'll be able to keep Carey Price safe this time. But it is looking like they're headed towards winning the division. And so I, I think that like at this point, uh, no matter what happens, it's best to not risk injury. I think tonight it's in their best interest to win, just, just to dash the Tampa Bay playoffs hope, playoff hopes a little bit further because they are going to be a dangerous team if they make it, especially, as you mentioned, if Steven Stamkos comes back. Yeah. It sounds um, like you're scared. It sounds you know. like, come on, don't be scared. We're, we're I'm not do. scared. I just, I, I don't trust the Rangers to stay away from the star goaltender. Ah, is, is what you're saying. come on. They're not going to do that. You know, you think Chris Kreider, are you saying you think Chris Kreider deliberately took Carey Price out in the playoffs four years ago? I took his I knee out. I will die on that hill. Okay. All right, watch out. Uh, now you're going to start getting death threats from New York Rangers fans. Uh, you can uh, find Laura on Twitter at the active stick. Uh, you can find Sam Wu, our executive producer on Twitter, at Primetime Sam Wu. Uh, we are live on site at Chickies and Pete's in South Philly. Still nobody has claimed these pucks, so we will, unless somebody shows up, we will draw again. I can't just give them away. I'm sorry. I'd love to just give them to the, the people who want them the most. Unfortunately, that's not how it works around here. Uh, other showdowns that we have coming up in the uh, National Hockey League tonight. Uh, where are my notes? Where are my notes? Uh, here we go. Uh, what else do we have going on? Uh, some pretty good ones. So Toronto's in Detroit. Uh, the uh, Joe Louis Arena. They're closing out Joe Louis Arena. This is it. And the uh, Red Wings are going to be playing their games in a in a arena named for a, a mediocre pizza delivery company going forward. I don't know. Uh, it's kind of a shame. And I know that they've, you know, corporate sponsorship. That's what they've got to do. And, and virtually every building. I think maybe this might... Might it be the last one in the NHL? It used to be the Spectrum here in Philly. Now it's Wells Fargo Center. Uh, it used to be, what did it used to be in, uh, in, uh, in Newark before, in New Jersey Brendan before? Brendan Byrne, Continental Airlines Arena. Right, okay. Whatever so, name it is. So now it's Prudential Center. Uh, in Montreal, it's the Bell Center. Joe Lewis Arena. Joe Lewis, one of the great athletes of all time and, uh, and a true citizen of Detroit. Kind of cool that it was called Joe Lewis Arena. It will no longer be called Joe Lewis Arena. They're going to have a much newer, much nicer building uh, for the Red Wings to play in and the Leafs visit it for the last time tonight. Uh, that should be a good one and one to watch with a lot of playoff implications. Ottawa faces Winnipeg. Ottawa is in danger of having the bottom fall out of their uh, playoff drive right now. Uh, they need a win. They need some saves. And it might be time to start looking at somebody other than Craig Anderson, who's been so, so bad uh, for so, so long. The last couple of weeks, he can't make a save, and they can't win a game. But Mike Condon, is he the answer? I don't know. Uh, finally, uh, from earlier today, Minnesota still falling apart. I think they've got two wins in their last 11 games. They get shut out by the uh, Nashville Predators. And Boston beat Florida 5-2. That's a huge win for the Bruins. 
And uh, jo uh, Joe, not Joe, Sean Thornton uh, says farewell uh, to uh, TD Garden in uh, Boston, his last game in Boston, as uh, he wraps up his storied career. <coughs> Losing my voice. Uh, we will reset. We'll be back in just a few moments. Uh, Russ uh, Cohen is going to be joining us next. Sportsology. Uh, let's talk about the Flyers. Let's talk about their prospect pool and talk about this year's draft a little bit. Uh, it sounds like an underwhelming draft class. Is that true? Or is it just lacking a headliner? Russ is going to tell us on the other side. This is Hockey Primetime on Sirius XM NHL Network Radio and streaming live at HockeyPrimetime.com. We're live at Chickies and Pete's in South Philly. All right. I, can they, am I, am I on the PA here? Can I be heard? Can you make it so I can be? I don't draw, I'm going to draw more. Uh, what, did you win? Yes, yes. But I, oh, God. All right. Can, should I, can I announce the thing again? How much time here? Okay. Might not be enough. Man, that was the worst. Oh, hello. All right, uh, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do another uh, draw here. We've got these two pucks to give away: the Danny Briere puck and the Claude Giroux. No, the Chris Pronger puck. All right, to have your raffle tickets in hand. Latest winner: one nine seven three two six six. 3266. Anyone have that ticket? 1973266. Come uh, up here to where the flashy light is to grab your prize if you do. All right, next one. 1973276. 3276. Uh, so uh, you've got 30 seconds to come up here and claim. If not, we'll try to do it again in, uh, in 15 minutes. Uh, again, those numbers were 1973266 and 1973276. That's for the uh, Chris Pronger sign puck and the uh, Danny Briere sign puck. Did I screw that up again? No, it is Danny Briere. Oh, and also, if you want a signed copy of uh, Kerry Frazier's book, The Final Call, Kerry Frazier, uh, not the first time he's offered me an unsolicited autograph. Uh, 197 3286. 197 3286 for the book. Here we go. Three. Two, one. Hey, welcome back. This is Hockey Prime Time. I'm Connor McKenna. We're live at Chickies and Pete's in South Philly. We've got about 30 minutes to go until game time. It's the Flyers and the Devils tonight. Also, uh, got Final Four action on the uh, big screens here. Uh, we got crab fries. We got crab fried poutines. We got great drink specials. And we've got prizes. Uh, not a lot of fun to be here. And uh, looking forward with the Flyers. Yes, I know technically they're still alive, but come on. The Flyers aren't going to make the playoffs, so win or lose tonight. And the uh, question is, what does the future look like? And uh, no one better to talk to about that, talk to about that than Russ Cohen. Uh, it sounded weird, but it was grammatically correct. Russ Cohen is with us. How you doing, Russ? I'm well, I'm well. You can follow uh, Russ on Twitter at Sportsology. Uh, he is one of the voices as well of Hockey Prospect Radio across now the TSN radio network, with the exception of the clowns in Edmonton for some reason. Uh, right? So, yeah, you doing all right, man? Yeah, doing good. And doing good. It seems like with the Flyers this year. Oh, uh, all right. Here, let's uh, let's see if we can uh, fix that a little bit. Uh, you know what we got to do is I'm going to flip it around for you here, and do it like that. All right, Russy, talking to the mic here. There we go. All right. Uh, so uh, so the Flyers prospect pool, uh, the way that it looks right now, is is the future as rosy as many people would have me believe? Yeah, it's deep. I mean, they they they've got tons of goalies. They've got tons of D-men. It's very deep. You know, the, the weird thing is, is in this town, they're in, in the radio business, they seem to be giving the Flyers the business because it doesn't look like they're going to make the playoffs. And just because they made it last year, like they should have realized it probably wasn't going to happen this year. Hextall laid out a plan. He's following the plan, but now people seem to be tiring of it because of the 76ers, because of what happened with them. But it's a different, you know, it's a different animal. It's funny, too, because in, in, you talk about a plan. 
but at the same time, expectations, right? Expectations can be a funny thing. You, often in sports, teams become the victims of their own success. Yes. The Flyers victims of maybe the, the unexpected success of a year ago, maybe even of a 10-game winning streak that was a little bit lucky, maybe you might say, and, and that sort of inflated their point total a little bit as well. Yep. Uh, how much have they been victims of that success, the unexpected success, and, and how much has that sort of skewed expectations and it's perception? It's definitely skewed things. I mean, last year, Shane Goss, the spirit, came on the scene. Nobody had a real antidote for him. Nobody had seen him play enough from the NHL level where they knew how to game plan. This year they have. They stand him up at the blue line. They don't give him a lot of space. It makes a difference. Goaltending, I mean, Steve Mason was a big reason they, they got all those points. Now, right. they've been flipping around with goalies all year. So that's something where maybe they lost a few points. But again, the Metro is a killer division. It's just there are teams that you could look at and just see that they're better than the Flyers. So the Flyers had their hot streak. Then, you know, now they get hot again, but it's a little too late. They have a lot of young talent. I've heard Provorov's been playing way too much. They finally took him off the power play. It was a good move because he was playing top minutes for any defenseman in the league, not just a rookie. And look what he's done. But, like, nobody wants to even, like, give credit for that. Like, here's a guy who was drafted. He walks right into the job. He takes over. I mean, that's more than even Mikhail Sergachev did, and he was – possibly expected to do that so who's to blame then i mean is it oversimplifying to say that maybe dave haxtall has not done a good job of handling I mean, the kid I, I i think you could say he's done an average to below average job but i think really who's to blame it's it's really expectations so if you want to blame the media for expectations i think that's fair okay and and then uh, other than that and i there's two things that i want to circle back to let's start with provorov though yeah how good of a player is this guy going to be He's going to be really good. He's going to be a guy who will be able to get you 50 points a year. He's going to play a number one spot. He is a great skater. He can play in all situations, but again, they'll run into the same problem that the Rangers run into with Ryan McDonough. How many minutes are you going to play him? Like, if you're going to put him on the penalty kill and the power play and top minutes, you got to sort of figure out what, what to do with him. So in the future, he might see a little less power play time, even in his prime, because they have other guys that can do that and will be able to do that. You have Goss to Spear, you'll have Travis Sanheim there either, even in the next year or two. That's going to be a big deal for them on the power play, too. Uh, earlier today, I, and talking about this, I, one of our guests said Travis Sanheim, he considers a lock next year. Is that an overstatement? I think it's an overstatement only because you would consider him a top four defenseman. He may not be able to be a top four D-man for that team next year. If they're willing to put him in that spot, they've got somebody who, who can mentor him, then that's fine. But they want to play him in all situations, and that's why they might be hesitant in doing that because he needs to play a certain amount of minutes. He can't be a guy that's playing bottom pairing minutes and then maybe doesn't see the ice the last six, seven minutes of a game. Can't do it with him. He's not going to be that kind of player. He's a more offensive player. He's, he's Listen, he's really improved too. He's gotten so much stronger. His stride is better. Like, he was always pretty fast, but his skating stride has improved now. So... He's got to be top four, or you got to just play him in the AHL again. Well, at the same time, I, I do wonder about, uh, you think about some of the other guys that they've got here uh, and, and how it is that they're going to fit in. You want to have the right mix of veterans and young yes. guys, right? You can't just throw six 18, 19, 20, 21-year-olds out there on the ice. You, you want to have the right mix. Uh, but do they have those guys? Do they need to maybe look for some of those guys? And on the, uh, on the free agent market this year, somebody like Carl Alsner, uh, maybe a veteran, you know, a, a young veteran in this league. It's, it's possible that an Osner could be a good fit because the Flyers will be losing some guys. I you know, look, Andrew McDonald's there to stay, whether fans like it or not. He <laughs> is going to be one of those veteran guys that that will help. But an Osner could really help, and I and I think he wouldn't break the bank. The money that they've already saved on Strait and what they'll save on Schultz, and I, I think it, it would make sense because you do have to mentor these guys. Look what the Bruins have done with Brandon Carlo. I mean. Carlo, I always looked at him as a really good defenseman, but he has Zdeno Chara to mentor him. That's a big deal. Right. And, you know, it's funny. I think about that in Montreal. You mentioned uh, Sergachev. Yeah. What Andre Markov might be able to do for him if he stays in Montreal or right. if he you know, continues his career and they have sign him. Yeah. I, I think that's something he could really help Sergachev with. Uh, no getting, question. getting used to Montreal, getting used to playing in this market. Yeah. And, and It's a that hard team. position, man. Defense center for young players, it's a hard position. I mean, when you're playing defense, you are basically set up to fail. The, the less you fail, the better you are. I mean, that's really the way it is. You're going to get beat. And on a lot of nights, it's when nobody's noticing you at all. Right, that you're, that that you're, you're doing a good job. Exactly. Yeah.
Uh, and so, and you did say, uh, and I don't know if I'm just, if I'm splitting hairs here, but I did hear you say that uh, Provorov will be playing in a number one spot. You didn't say he'd be a number one guy. No, I think he'll be a number he'll one guy. He'll be a number one guy. You know, he'll be a number okay. one guy. There's, uh, there's no question in my mind. All right, let's circle back to something you said at the beginning there, that Ron Hextall has a plan. Right. What is that plan? The plan is he's, he's making sure that guys he brings in are like 30, 31 or less if he's bringing in free agents. He is building up speed. He wants speed on the blue line. They have speed on the blue line with, with Gostaspier. They have it with Provorov. They have it with Sandheim. Morenz actually as a straight line skater pretty fast. He's still a little bit of a project. Uh, Hogg is going to be up possibly next year. I think he is completely ready. He, Robert Hogg, is, he can skate. So, so you have that. You have um, forwards like Travis Konechny, who's very quick, quick thinking. That's another thing is he, he wants guys that think the game quickly. Like Mike Vecchione, the guy they just signed from Union. Yeah. Excellent player. They had him in camp. It seemed like he went kind of unnoticed in camp, even though he played in the Frozen Four with Shane Gossespierre on Union. But the thing that really helped him is when I interviewed him, he said, I'm going to take what I learned from this camp and I'm going to apply it to the next season, meaning this year in Union. And he did. He's a Hobie Baker finalist, but he's going to play fourth line center. He is not a superstar. A lot of times when you sign a college free agent, they're not superstars but he's going to serve an important role. The fourth line center spot for the Flyers has been a dead spot for years now, and he can play defense. He's got lower body strength, and he blocks shots, and he knows how to get in guys' way, and he'll provide some offense too. Do we get a little bit too excited about these yeah. Kobe Baker guys? Yeah, yeah, like I think about absolutely. Jimmy VC last year. Yeah. Oh, Jimmy VC. I mean, he's having a good dark. year, though. He's, he is. At the same time, the, the Rangers not healthy scratch him yesterday? Yeah, this is Elaine Vigneault, though. I mean, he's just trying to... To, to motivate him, and, and if he felt like he hit a wall, just alleviate that. But he's got 15 goals. It's like, you, you know, it's well, not... But didn't he also have 10 goals in the first 25 sure, games? Sure, sure. But there's, you're going to have to live with that, though, right. when you bring in a guy like that. But he is a 200-foot player most of the time. He is a good player. Now, but that's, that's the high end. I mean, Will Butcher is another guy we're going to hear about as we get into August. If he, if he doesn't sign with, with Colorado, we're going to hear about him. He's playing in the Frozen Four with Denver. That's another really great skating defenseman who's got an offensive game. These guys, when they come in, very rarely are they superstars. The superstars are the Clayton Kellers, the guys who are there for a year and then they leave. And Keller, you think, in, in Arizona? You're he could be a superstar. A superstar NHLer. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. they could use one of those they in, could. Uh, in Arizona. They could. And it might take a little time because he doesn't have necessarily the right guys with him there yet. But, you know, put him with Domi, I think you'll have something pretty good. Okay, uh, and speaking of, and this is way out of left field, but what do you think's happened to Anthony Duclair after a lot of promise in a 20-goal season a year ago? You know, what I think has happened to him is Dave Tippett really demands like that unbelievable 200-foot game, 100% effort all the time, and I think Duclair suffers from that sometimes. And I don't think he does it on purpose because I've watched him since he's young. I watched him on the Rangers. He, I, I think he's, he's an excellent skater, and, and the kid can play. The kid can score offensively. He, he'll get you 40 points a year, maybe 50. He will be a detriment sometimes on defense, and he might have some bad shifts. And I think Dave Tippett grew tired of that. Right. And I think that's the issue. But I think, and I, I believe even the Flyers had interest in him, I believe a lot of teams will still have interest in him because of his speed and his offensive ability. And, and the kid has a great attitude. I think a lot of, there was a lot of that early on where, there was maybe this, ha you know, like you would say, a hashtag that he didn't have a great attitude. He does. And so I think he'll make it in this league. But, you know, sometimes guys bounce around early on. All right. So this is uh, Hockey Primetime here on uh, Sirius XM NHL Network Radio and streaming live at uh, HockeyPrimetime.com. We've got, our, we've got uh, these, these pucks to give away. We're still trying to give away. Nobody has claimed them yet. We do still have some hard She cores. really wants one. I, I know. I, I know. And, and, and part of me, I just I feel like it wouldn't be fair Right. to the other people if I did it, but I must say that I, I'm very tempted to just give her a puck. She's burning a I, hole through you. I know. Right that's now. why I'm facing this way. It's yeah. a good move. Good move. Uh, so uh, goaltending woes in Philadelphia, and I think it's a fascinating time right now with Steve Mason. What's going to happen there? Michael Neuber signed, but is he going to make it through the expansion draft? Uh, and then uh, you've got uh, some prospects as well. I mean, there's, there's some possibilities. And right. then you've got guys on the market too as well. well why is it that goaltending is always a question mark and always has been as long as in my entire lifetime? You know, what, what's funny is on the prospect level, it's not a question anymore, but it still is on the NHL level. What I think it will happen is 
Mason will become a UFA. The goalie market's not going to be good this year, free agent-wise. There's only going to be a few spots in the league that actually you can get a starting job at. So someone like Mason will hang out there as a UFA during that period of the expansion draft. Neuberth, I don't think they're going to protect. I think they're going to protect Stellars. And Neuberth has a nice two-year deal and could go back to his old boss and George McPhee, who was at the game last game. George McPhee just happened to be there. Really? And, and on a two-year deal, that's a pretty affordable deal for a guy who played with Washington. I think you could see that happening. Now, I think Carter Hart is still their best prospect. Stellars isn't a prospect anymore because he's played a couple years of pro. Right. So I think he's their best prospect. And he's still a couple years away, but he thinks the game fast. He's maybe as smart as Mike Richter as far as having that goalie brain. Okay. And I think he just has to fill out physically, and, and it really is a talent. I think Merrick Madsen has turned out to be their second best now, who's playing for Harvard. I think Harvard can go all the way in this Frozen Four. I know everybody wants to point to Denver because they look like a juggernaut. I like Harvard, and Madsen has every year has put on weight. I've watched him every year in camp, and now he's got the mental capacity. Like, he's, he's a, an applied mathematics major, so that's, that's pretty good for angles and goaltending to begin with. But the thing is, the games he played the other day, he got peppered early on. And I got to tell you, he did a great job. And, and so I think that's your second best. And then Felix Sandstrom, they're going to probably try and bring him over. He's playing over in Sweden. He had a great World Juniors. He's a little bit off in the mental game, but he's really great everywhere else. Okay. And so I think if you do let him turn pro and play a lot of games, maybe in a year or two you'll really have something there. So... There's a lot there. They need a guy to bridge the gap. Right. They need someone for two years. That's what they need. Well, the question is, who is that guy? Hey, uh, Russ, thanks for your time, man. I All appreciate right, Connor. It. Anytime. That is Russ Cohen. Thanks for having me. At uh, Sportsology. Uh, Sportsology is a Pro Hockey Writers Association member. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter at Sportsology. You can go to Sportsology.com. And you can listen to Hockey Prospect Radio uh, for more on the future of stars of the National Hockey League. Coming up next, my friend Stephen Wino from the Associated Press is going to be joining us. He's on his way, will be on his way to the game as soon as we wrap up. Uh, but we have some very important matters to discuss. That's what's coming up next. This is Hockey Primetime on Sirius XM NHL Network Radio and streaming live at HockeyPrimetime.com. This stuff here. Who do you think is their goalie next year? Who the Caps won in the first round? The threat of Tampa. A lot of the shit we talked about yesterday. Yeah. Eh, exactly. Yeah. And you're and you're cruising right over to the uh, to the thing after. Cool. And uh, there is a bus. Oh. Okay, a crab bus. Cool. Well, that's good. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, I know. I wouldn't mind watching the Canadians game. It's probably a little crazy to... I would imagine. Uh, I would imagine. Thank you. That's the way... Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, maybe raise that a little bit. There you go. Yeah, that's good. It's always a struggle. Glad to uh, see so you're the you're the kind of person who asks. A lot of people just... I'd rather just do my levels now. Just so well, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, better than live on the air which we just did. <coughs> All right, we still have two prizes to give away. And your fans left. I know, I know. <laughs> they were like, they were so persistent. Like, they, they really wanted it, you know? <coughs> Three, two, one. 
All right, this is Hockey Primetime, final moments of the show. We've got about 10 minutes to go until uh, we turn it over. It's game time. We've got a bunch of 7 o'clock starts coming your way, and you'll have live coverage of tonight's action on Sirius XM NHL Network Radio. Uh, we are live at Chickies and Pete's in South Philadelphia. My name is Connor McKenna. I'm with my next special guest. His name is Stephen Wino of the Associated Press. Hello. Hi, Connor. How are you? I'm well. <laughs> I'm well. I was, I was glad to learn uh, that, uh, that you were going to be here. Uh, when, I, when I was here, and uh, glad to have uh, had a chance to hang out with you yesterday. As we were just saying off air, what we'll do is we'll just repeat the conversation we had at the bar yesterday. That, that sounds great. While maybe leaving out certain, uh, certain things. Certain profanity. Yeah, yeah right, the sure, things, right. that, things that yes. should be said on the radio. Right. Uh, it's the Flyers and the Devils tonight. Uh, the Devils have owned the Flyers this year. Uh, and the Flyers, uh, I know there are scenarios, but... Are we ready? Are we putting a fork in the Philadelphia Flyers? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're done. The Islanders are done with the John Tavares injury. Uh, he's out for the season. I, I, Matt Reed is out for the season. Even without that injury, it's just too much ground for the Flyers to make up. Uh, after the Bruins won this afternoon, I think the Flyers can actually be eliminated by the end of the night, right. uh, with, depending on what the Maple Leafs do in, if in the Detroit. Leafs, if the Leafs get a point and the Flyers lose in regulation. Then, then it's over. Then so, it's over. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm willing to call it on, on this team. Uh, they did not have that heroic run like they had to the playoffs last year or, or Ottawa had a couple years ago. Uh, it just wasn't in the cards for, for this team this year. It is weird how the Devils have, have owned them. They've outscored them 14-3. to three. Uh, they, they actually ended that 10-game winning streak in emphatic fashion by blowing them out of the water. Uh, this is a theme I've sort of come back to a lot this year. But to what extent do you think that 10-game winning streak that was honestly a little bit of a fluky, as much as a 10-game winning streak can be, there was a ton of good fortune along the way. How much is that sort of masked uh, what are maybe deeper issues with this team? Oh, no, it, it, it has, and it did at the time. Because even then, they were get, the Flyers were getting every single bounce you could have possibly gotten in that stretch. And then after the 10-game winning streak was over, it was like all the bounces and, and went the other way, and the Flyers were kind of regressing to the mean of what they were supposed to be. And without that 10-game winning streak, this is a team that probably is, same thing, 8, 10 points out of a playoff spot a team that's middle of the pack of the Eastern Conference. Not a bad team. I mean, too much talent to be a bad team, uh, but still not as good on defense as they want to be. Uh, all those prospects you and Russ talked about who are on the way or, or, or kind of growing now with the Flyers are going to help that. But this is a team that on that 10-game winning streak got a lot of those fortunate bounces, got some hot goaltending and, and, and a lot of offense. And then when those goals dried up, they didn't have the defense to make up for it. So speaking of goaltending, uh, if you're a betting man, who's the Flyers' number one goaltender next year? Ben Bishop. Uh, l l let's, let's say Ben Bishop is, is the guy because I don't know how much of a market there is out there for goaltenders. Uh, Steve Mason has been played a lot down the stretch. I don't know if he is their guy in the future. Michael Neuverth signed that extension. He, in theory, could be their backup or could be traded uh, or, or picked by Las Vegas in the expansion, in the expansion draft next year. Uh, I, ben Bishop is the top available guy on the market. Mark andre Fleury is not getting traded here. Uh, there are a few other options, maybe a Brian Elliott sort of type. But if I'm guessing right now, if I'm betting, I'm putting Ben Bishop as the odds-on favorite. Okay. And and I think about it. I think he's making 5.95 against the cap right mm -hmm. now. Does Ben Bishop get a raise I think that's about right. I, I think something like $6 million a yeah. year. But you, but given the market for goaltenders, who really needs a goalie out there that you might the Flyers might be able to get him for on a three- or four-year contract for a guy who's a little bit older? At all concerned about Ben Bishop long-term, given the fact that he's had his worst season this year in, in the last few? I, I'm more concerned the injuries. I'm more concerned that Ben Bishop has a tendency to get injured and cost you games than I am about his play. I, I think Ben Bishop is a good goaltender. I think he's also a guy who needs to play uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of, of 55, 60 games a year to be in a rhythm. He didn't get that this year. Andre Vasilevsky played way more than, 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 than what Ben Bishop was used to. He's a rhythm goaltender. Ben Bishop plays better when he knows he's the guy. Okay. All right, so uh, you're not the first, and uh, you will be the last person to say that it uh, will be Ben Bishop, <laughs> the, uh, the goalie here in Philadelphia next year. Uh, how about John Tavares, who you just mentioned? Uh, since uh, it looks like he's played his last game this year for the Islanders, has he played his last game for the New York Islanders? No, I, I don't think so. And, and, and I think the Islanders, they have something that they have to figure out where they're going to play their games. They have to figure out whether it's going to be Barclays in Brooklyn, whether it's going to be back at Nassau, or, or whether it's going to be at City Field, what the long-term future is. Because John Tavares does care about City that. City Field? The, 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 they've talked about doing the arena right by City Field. Oh, by City Field. Yeah, no, okay. not okay. at City Field. Right, that'd, not be, outdoors. that'd be awkward. Not outdoors for 41 yeah. games. Um, but whether they're going to have it in Queens, whether they're going to go back there. Once they figure that out, John Tavares has to, be, has to buy into the future there. Does he like Doug Wade as a coach? Is Doug Wade your future coach? It, you've got to 
really, he's the franchise of, of, uh, right there. Like, you need to consult with him on, on those kind of moves because you can't afford to have a Stamco situation where you're hanging on next year and not knowing if he's going to leave. And maybe a little bit more likely that he doesn't stay and let alone take a discount to do it. If I'm John Tavares, I'm saying, all right, I've given you guys maybe the best years of my career already. Still a relatively young man. He'll be 27 next year, right? Yep. Still, uh, but still, still a top 5, 10 player in the game. And at the same time, he's been giving them, what, 5.75 as a cap hit, which is criminal, uh, really, as far as that goes. And I'm not saying he needs to overcompensate or break the bank the other way, but... But he will. You want to get paid, yeah, right? Yeah, and, and he will. And, and, and we're looking at... Eight, you're probably looking at $8 million at least as, as, a, as a cap hit for a guy like John Tavares in, in the future. I, I do think he likes it there in, in terms of the team itself. I don't know that he loves the, the, the Long Island Railroad setup and all that. Right. But he does like the team. If you convince him that this is a team that's going to win in the near future, that, that's part of the process of keeping it John Tavares. Steven Stamkos won't play tonight for the, Phil for the Tampa Bay Lightning right. as they take on the uh, Canadians. Uh, Tyler Johnson not playing either, but it looks like their returns could be imminent. And there is always the chance, and it's an outside chance at this point, but they could get into the playoffs, and that would set up a clash with the Washington Capitals. Oh, man. Uh, you're in the D.C. area. You spent years on the beat covering the Washington Capitals. Were you covering them back in 2010? Uh, I, 2011, when they lost the Lightning, they were swept out of the second round. Yes. And, and there's been a couple of uh, playoff hiccups, certainly for this team. Uh, how do you feel about them this year? Is, is this a team ready to go on a run? It, it should be. I mean, if they don't play like they did last night, which Barry Trotz called junk uh, out in Arizona, if, if they play the way they've played over the last really four or five months, this is a championship team. This is, this is, a, this is the year team because they don't have a choice. They've got a lot of guys who are up, uh, free agents at the end of the year, as we've talked about a lot, TJ Oshie, Carl Osner, uh, new deals needed for Evgeny Kuznetsov and a bunch of other RFAs. This is their year. They're going to probably lose Philip Grubauer in the expansion draft too. They, it has to be their year. They don't want to run into Steven Stamkos and the Lightning in the first round. Uh, they probably don't want to run into the Ottawa Senators either, a team that frustrates the heck out of them. Uh, but this is a team that if they get the right breaks in the playoffs and, and Alex Ovechkin plays the way he has and then you get goaltending from Braden Holpe, this should be a, a cup contending team. Who do they want in the first round in a perfect world? Uh, Carolina or Boston. Uh, but Boston uh, among the real c possible contenders, it, either Boston or Toronto would be fine. Yeah. I think Boston's a team that, that, that Braden Holpe specifically has owned in his career, I think the Capitals match up very well against the Boston Bruins. Who do they want to avoid? Uh, Tampa Bay, for yeah. sure, and Ottawa. Uh, Ottawa's a team that gives the Capitals spits. They don't want to see Guy Boucher again. Yeah, it's true, right? You're talking about 2011, right? Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, with uh, Stephen Wino, just wrapping it up here. So if you're calling it today, who's the favorite? Who's your favorite in the Eastern Conference? It's the Washington Capitals. It's it, Capitals? It, it has to be. And, and, and Columbus and Pittsburgh are both very good teams, but they're going go to have to go through each other. They're going to have to play each other in the first round. So you're... You're knocking out one of those teams. The Capitals are the, are, are the favorite, considering that, that even though they're going to have a tough second-round matchup, I don't like anybody on the other side of the draw uh, to win it. The Capitals have to be the favorite. I think Chicago is the favorite out in the West. Washington versus Chicago in the Stanley Cup Final. Be fun. Well, yeah. I mean, for partying purposes, I'd like <laughs> Montreal-Chicago. Montreal-Nashville? Montreal-Nashville, yeah. the Subban Bowl. That'd be nice, too. Uh, Stephen, thanks for your time, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Connor. That is Stephen Wino of the Associated Press. Uh, he's off to the game, and that's it for us. Uh, big thank you to everybody here at Chickies and Pete South Philly, all the fans who came out, uh, and a big thank you to our executive producer, Sam Wu, uh, Chris Tobin here on site, and the whole gang who put everything together, Matteo Pasculi at Sirius XM. Thank you for listening to the show. Laura Saba for her hard work of putting the show together, and uh, I, that's all I can think of right now. Hi, Mom. I'll be home soon. Uh, thank you, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Oh, man, you're freaking me out there. <laughs> thank you.